Hello everyone at Clear Spring 4th Grade, this is Andrew's dad. There were a few things we didn't get a chance to finish talking about when I was out there, so I wanted to go back and see if I could cover those. You remember we were talking about electrons, electricity, and dangerous stuff that you should not do. Remember, if you touch a power line with a stick or anything else, you will die. So don't do that. By the way, I got all of the letters that you sent me and I read every single one of them. They were terrific. Thank you. A lot of you were interested in the part where I had a glass of water and we were talking about how many lightning strikes you could make if you could take all of the electrons out of a single drop and put it up in a cloud. Well, I wanted to go back and redo that calculation using some updated numbers that I got from this guy. His name is Richard Hasbrook and he's an electrical engineer at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Several years ago, I took a class that he was teaching where he discussed all of the things that he had learned doing experiments launching rockets up into thunderstorms. These were special rockets that would spool out a small wire that went from the launch pad and would take it all the way up into the cloud. If the conditions were right, he could induce a lightning strike and learn about the amount of charge each lightning strike carried. So using those numbers, I wanted to redo the calculation. How many lightning strikes are in a drop of water? Well, in order to do that calculation, we have to work with a number called a mole. Not this kind of mole. This is a mole. A mole is a number, like 10, or a million, or a mole. Mole is the name that we give to this number, just like we give the name dozen to the number 12. A mole is the name that we give to this number. Personally, I don't understand why we have the name dozen. It's not like anybody would say, wow, I'm so glad we have the name dozen because that's so much easier to say than 12. But I do understand why we have the name mole. A mole is a very large number and if you had to say it, it would take a long time. So it's a lot easier just to say mole. The mole was developed by a chemist named Avogadro. This is a picture of Avogadro. And in honor of the research that he did, we call this Avogadro's number. It's a mole. Mole, 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 mole. And just for good measure, here's a dozen moles. So the neat thing about using moles is that if we go to the periodic table of elements, it tells us how much a mole of different elements weigh. The periodic table of elements tells us that one mole of oxygen atoms weighs 16 grams. One mole of hydrogen atoms weighs one gram. We know that water is H2O, that's two hydrogens and one oxygen. So adding those numbers up, we can determine that one mole of water weighs 18 grams. That's a little more than half an ounce. So using that information, we can determine that one kilogram of water contains 55 and a half moles of water molecules. One kilogram of water is also equal to one liter of water. And one milliliter of water is a thousandth of that. So that means one milliliter of water contains this many moles of water molecules. Back in college, I learned that 20 drops is about equal to one milliliter. So if we divide all that by 20, we can determine that one drop of water contains this tiny number of moles of water molecules. That doesn't seem like much, but remember a mole is a really big number. So even though one drop of water contains only this many moles of water molecules, it's still this many water molecules. And that's a lot. Each of those water molecules contains electrons. And again, using the periodic table of elements, we can determine how many electrons are in each water molecule. So one drop of water contains this many electrons. Electrical engineers like to use a term called a coulomb. A coulomb is not a number. A coulomb is a unit of charge, but it takes this many electrons to make a coulomb of negative charge. Conversely, this many protons would make a coulomb of positive charge. Using the information we've already determined, we know that one drop of water contains 2,660 coulombs. Now it's important to know that coulombs describe charge. And in a glass of water, there's actually no charge. And that's because the number of electrons that are in a glass of water are approximately equal to the number of protons. Remember, we talked about the fact that they like to hang out together. And so really, the charge in a glass of water is zero because the protons and the electrons cancel each other out. And that's a good thing because you wouldn't want to get struck by lightning every time you try to take a sip of water. But in our discussion, we were talking about what would happen if you could magically take all the electrons out of that drop of water. How many lightning strikes could you make? Well, a drop of water contains 2,660 coulombs. Richard Hasbrook's research tells us that there's about 15 coulombs in a typical lightning strike. 
But what he also said was that some of the biggest lightning strikes in the world transfer up to 350 coulombs. That's a lot of coulombs. So if we divide 2,660 by 15, we find there's 177 typical lightning strikes in a drop of water. But for the really, really big lightning strikes, it's eight. Only eight? What a ripoff! I want my money back, you might say. But remember, that was for just the big ones. Using the electrons found in one drop of water, you can make over 170 typical lightning strikes. And that's a lot of lightning for just a little drop of water. So a lot of you ask the question, why can a bird stay on an electric power line without getting electrocuted? And I said, because the bird is not touching the ground or the pole or anything else. Therefore, there's no path to ground through the bird and no electrons pass through the bird. We cannot touch the wires because our feet are almost always on the ground. And whenever we're touching the ground or we are touching something else that is touching the ground, we say that we might be grounded. Grounded is the word that means that you are electrically connected to the ground. And remember, at the very high voltages that are on power lines, rubber shoes and sticks, things that we don't normally think of as conductors of electricity, well, at the very high voltages that are on power lines, they certainly do conduct enough electricity to hurt or kill you. What I'm going to show you now is a neat video that tells construction workers what to do if they accidentally touch a power line with the heavy equipment that they're using. Listen carefully and you'll hear them talking about a path to ground. It's important to understand why it's safer to stay on the machine during an electrical contact. It involves the flowing of electricity from source to ground. Electricity will always take all paths to ground. Anything can be a conductor. Even dry wood or plastic will conduct a current if the conditions are right. But how well it conducts electricity affects its ability to hurt you. For example, a bird on a wire. When a bird lands on a single strand of wire, it is at the same voltage as the wire and will suffer no harm. There is also no path to ground. However, if the bird is large enough to touch another wire, the cross arm, or the top of the pole with its wing when it flies away, it will create a path to ground and will be killed. If contact with a power line is made, a path to ground is established. If you are the operator of a machine that contacts a power line, move the machine to break contact. If the machine cannot be moved and there is no immediate danger from fire, stay where you are. Keep in mind that the ground for quite a distance around the machine will be energized. Warn others to stay back a minimum of 10 meters or 33 feet and tell someone to call the power company. If a fire starts and you have to get off the machine, Never step onto the ground while still in contact with the machine. The object is to ensure your entire body clears the machine and that you land on your feet without stumbling. Keep your feet together and take short hops or shuffle a minimum of 10 meters or 33 feet. Separating your feet can cause the electricity to pass through your body because it will give the electricity another path to flow through. So it seemed like everybody's favorite video was the stick on the wire. And here it is again. This video shows what happens when a tree touches a power line.
what I was kind of concerned about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I'm going to get a little bit of a You can see the electricity starting to flow down through the tree to the ground. As the tree burns and carbon is formed, the tree gets more and more conductive and the power increases through the tree. The power company has devices called circuit breakers in certain parts of the power distribution system. When a serious fault occurs, like this one with the tree touching the power line, the power line experiences a surge in electrical current. When the surge becomes great enough, the circuit breaker will turn off the power to prevent damage to the power lines. And that happens right about now. Here's another video of a tree falling on a power line. Again, when the power line hits the ground, there's a surge and the power goes off when the circuit breaker turns off the power. But watch what happens 10 seconds later. The power will automatically turn on just in case the fault is cleared on its own. In this case, the fault was still there and the circuit breaker turned off the power again. Let's replay that last video again and imagine somebody doing something foolish. Oh dear, that telephone pole just fell and it's blocking traffic. Good thing the power's off. Let me grab a hold of this thing and pull it out of the way. Oh, that guy would be owned. Okay, let's go back to that video with the tree again and watch it with the circuit breakers in mind. Woo! Oh good, the power went out. Let me get my chainsaw and cut this dead tree down for my neighbor. This cycling of power, on and off, can go on for many minutes. But while the first interruption was only about 10 seconds, the next interruption might last 45 seconds, and then several minutes. The fact is, you never know when the power might come back on, and it will happen without warning and at any moment. So you must never approach downed power lines, even if you think they're off, even if you're certain they're off. Well, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. That's all I have for this video. I look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Goodbye.